Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life for us, affording us the opportunity to come before you. The veil was torn that night on the cross, opening up the doors, the gateways to heaven for us. Thank you, Father, for allowing that. Now, Lord, be with us this day as we begin and continue to celebrate under your kingdom, under your authority. We ask you to be with us and bless all that are here this morning and those who are online. Amen. Let us continue turning in our hymnals. I believe it's 350. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus.
freedom of the Holy Spirit to flow. My wife, Mary, good to see you this morning. Don't let Satan steal your joy. The Lord gave you peace and joy that surpasses all understanding. Take that with you no matter where you go. And keep the smile on your face for the Lord. Because they'll know we're Christians by our love, by our smiles. They'll see Jesus. Hopefully within our heart, they'll see Jesus. Good to see you this morning, Raymond. Tonight, Sunday evening service, 6 p.m., Phil will be bringing Phil will be bringing forth the message tonight. I just want to make sure you heard me again. I get the wave. <laughs> Time of uh, praise and uh, sharing, hymn songs, hymn songs, and so forth. Um, Care net bottles are up here on to my left, your right. Uh, if you haven't received one yet, they're due back next week. But you can fill it up this week and bring it back next week for Father's Day. Father's Day is the 18th which is next week at the same time. The Hiss Songs will be in concert here. Um, so that will be at uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. So feel free to bring friends, invite your friends. This is the time that they get to hear music. Um, and the Hiss Songs are, have been on um, Enlighten, and they're doing, uh, the Lord is blessing them very, you know, doing, they're doing very well. Uh, praise be to the Lord, and the family is doing great. So it'll be good to see them this year. Um, June 25th, the week after, 4 p.m. down in Taylor Hall, we'll be having a uh, time of recognition for Pastor Dave and Mary Ann for the years of service here to the church. That will be 4 p.m. We ask, instead of getting one card, that you would pre get a card, put your notes in it, bring it that day or that Sunday. If you're not going to be in the afternoon, bring it to us, and we'll get that to them Sunday afternoon. Um, so that's at 4 p.m. We'll be just doing a time of sharing, a time of uh, a nice time of uh, fellowship. So that will be the 25th. July 2nd is our celebration day here at the church. We're going to be doing a little luncheon afterwards, uh, sandwiches and hospitality is taking care of the other. Um, but that's the day that we just get to share the love that the Lord has given to us. We may call upon you to give a testimony or other. Um, if you can sing, if you'd like to sing a song for the Lord, that would be a day to do that also. Uh, Pastor Robbins is coming up tonight for a couple days, him and his children preparing for um, next year's school season and getting things situated. Am I correct on that, Evie? So be praying for Traveling Mercies for Pastor Robbins. They'll be here on the 2nd. Officially, that'll be his start day. Um, looking forward to the leaving and to uh, having a, a new pastor. Um, but praise God, all things work out to the good for the kingdom and the glory. On July 5th is Vacation Bible School for all our kids. Adults wishing to help or bringing in items for that, you may do so, getting that to uh, here to the church. But on the 5th, it's, I got it right, 9 o'clock? Pam, right? 9 to 11. 11.30, 9 to 11.30, Thursday, Friday. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Got it, after the 4th, after the 5th, the I'm just, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday will be the closing closing ceremony on the Saturday with a, um, a cookout um, to close up the, um, the family day. And all are welcome for that uh, Saturday. If you can't make vacation Bible because we as adults, but come in on that, on the 8th at, um, at 11 o'clock. Is it 11 o'clock for that? 11.30. 30. Okay. So those are things that are going on. And as we continue to go forward, may we just continually seek his face in your wisdom, his wisdom. Our prayer and praise list, just want to bring that to your attention. That is here, and it's in your bulletin. Please take that with you today and pray over that during the week for the different things. Raymond. I, I do have that note, Raymond. Um, we love because he first loved us. That was the thing that Raymond just gave me, which is true. We love because he first loved us, and that was our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As we continue on, choir. Yeah. Dear, dear. 
Let us continue in our hymnals turning to page 514, In My Heart the Rings a Melody. 515, I'm sorry, since Jesus came into my heart. All right. <laughs> I'm good on that. Thank you, ladies. Let us please stand and sing this together. And those here for Children's Church will be going back. Some of already, some already be back there for us. But may we please stand and sing, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart.
campfires years ago used to have. The song was to sing. Praise God for them. You may be seated. It's good to see you once again all. Brother Bill, you have to sit. You can come up and bless us with the message for the Holy Spirit. Good morning. Situated here. Unpack everything. You all hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. We're on testing one, two. Yeah, we're good. Okay. Uh, thank you, Patrick and Tony, for the work you do in the sound and the music. I'm always blessed. Maybe small in number, but very powerful in praise. I, I just really loved a lot of those old praise songs, and uh, I had a nice talk with uh, Margaret this morning. I said, um, you know, back in the 80s when those were first coming out, they were so powerful. You know, they're all about worship and praising of God, and I um, really, really enjoyed those. Okay, um, we have a lot of prayer requests today, so we're going to pray for our people that are on the sheet here. And um, let's do that right now. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to gather in your name, in your house. Father, we're very mindful that there are other gatherings all around this world today that do not have the luxury of a building, even chairs. Some are just sitting in a... Uh, a patch of dirt on the ground listening to the word proclaimed. So, Father, we are grateful for what you have blessed us with today. And, Father, we bring before you all of our uh, prayer requests. Your word says to come before you with um, praises and to singing and to also let our requests be made known to you. And so all of these requests, Father, I lift before your throne of grace asking that you would move and direct and um, have your way in each of these um, situations that people are going through right now. So, Father, we ask that your uh, provision of your Holy Spirit would be very rich and thick during this time. Lord, I ask that your spirit of peace would descend upon this place. It would be a spirit of calm, that we put all of our anxieties and all of our worries at the foot of the cross. Help us to concentrate on what you are saying today. And Father, I just ask that you would keep me hidden behind the cross of Jesus today, that he be lifted high. And Father, if you don't put the, the anointing, the weight of heaven behind these words, Father, they just fall to the ground, and the birds eat the seed, and, and nothing is accomplished. So Father, I'm asking May your will be done today. Come, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Our background or our base scripture this morning is Psalm 145. And if you would like, you, you may turn there. Um, Psalm 145, verses 8 to 9. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and his tender mercies. Wait a minute, let's read that again. The Lord is good to who? All. Oh. And his tender mercies are over all his works. Amen. Now, if you would turn with me to the book of Luke, this is where our main study will be this morning. Luke chapter 18. Starting with verse 35. Then it happened, as he was coming near Jericho, that a certain blind man sat by the road, begging. And hearing a multitude passing by, he asked what it meant. So they told him that Jesus of Nazareth was passing by. And he cried out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then those who went before warned him that he should be quiet. But he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him 
to be brought to him. And when he had come near, he asked him, saying, What do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed him, glorifying God and all the people. When they saw it, gave praise to God. Isn't that wonderful? Mm. They say that everyone loves a parade. And I've been to a few parades through the years, and I've always enjoyed uh, getting there early to get a good spot. And um, the marching bands are my favorite. And then the antique cars, and the Heather Shriners, and the little go-karts doing figure eights. And I'm amazed that they don't run into each other, but I guess they practice. But a um, member of my family went to the Columbus Day Parade in Westerly one year. And um, the individual got there plenty early, got a prime seat right on the grass, on the hill there, um, <laughs> by the train station. They didn't want to miss anything. And, um, well, instead of uh, not missing anything, they missed everything. Um, see, in Westerly, the Columbus Day Parade is the day before the actual holiday. And so after an hour of sitting, seeing the traffic not stopped, no parade going on, um, realizing there was no parade that day. <laughs> in fact, they were told, uh, there's no parade, buddy. Oh, so the individual quietly packed up and went home. Seems that they were a day late in a parade short. <laughs> I won't tell on you, Dad, so. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a running joke in our family for a while now. In our opening passage this morning, we have a similar situation. And in verse 35, we see the phrase, there is a crowd of people gathering around Jesus as he is walking through town. Then it happened. It's interesting, scripture uses this phrase as if something big was about to happen. And indeed it was. Uh, and it was about to. And in this particular situation, then it happened, serves as a dividing line between the dull and mundane to, of ordinary life to something interesting and out of the ordinary. And we're introduced to a man. He is blind, he is begging, and he is desperate. He is at the mercy of anyone who will take pity on him. Begging for daily sustenance, Wondering, will I have enough food for today? Will I be taken advantage of because of my handicap of being blind? He is in a daily desperate situation of what life has handed to him. And I think about the blind patient I had a while back, which I told you about in a previous message. And at the mercy of caregivers who could have shown more mercy, in my opinion. Now this man, he may be blind, but he can hear. And he hears something, he hears a crowd passing by him. And he asks probably one of the most important questions in the New Testament. What does this mean? The answer, Jesus is passing by. In order to understand the significance of this statement, we need to understand who Jesus is and why there was so much commotion around him. Who is this Jesus? Growing up, to me, Jesus was someone who died for my sins. And if I accepted him as my savior, I would go to heaven someday when I die. Follow the rules of the church or the denomination and you're fine. Now, this may be news to some here today, but the Christian life is not following a list of rules and regulations in order to gain favor with God. Nobody gains favor with God. In their own efforts, it's by God's mercy. Can I get an amen? amen? Yes, there are guidelines to follow, but you don't gain or curry special favor with God just by following them. Are you following me, church? Yes. Titus 3.5 tells us, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his what? Mercy. Mercy. He has saved us. The Christian life is a relationship with the almighty God 
who loves you unconditionally. He accepts you unconditionally, but loves you too much to leave you the way he found you. Isn't that true? This is why Jesus' passing by was so important. For the first time in the history of the world, people saw what God looked like in human form. In theology terms, they call this the incarnate Jesus, God in the flesh. Jesus walked among his creation. He touched them. He held them. He talked with the creation. He healed his creation. He loved his creation. He delivered his creation from the works of the devil. He wept with his creation. He died for his creation. He recovers and redeems his creation. We are all familiar with the prodigal son in Luke chapter 15. And many of us know this story very well. The youngest son demands his inheritance. He goes off to a foreign land and spends it all on loose and riotous living. Every day was a party until the money ran out. Almost sounds like a government I know about. But when he comes to a place of desperation, rock bottom, he comes to his senses and says, why not return home and live as a servant of my father? In fact, if memory serves me correctly, the servants do very well. And when the son returns home, now watch this, the father comes running to his son, which is undignified in that culture for a father to do. The father embraces his son, kisses his son, and puts a robe around him to cover the stench of his son. He puts a ring on his finger. He puts shoes on his feet. Now, there were two brothers that this father had. And the two brothers in this parable represent two different things. The older brother in this parable represents the Old Testament law, working to keep the law. And when we are introduced to him, he is indeed doing that. He is working in the field. The, the, law, the law demanded accountability for all your actions. It demanded where every cent was spent. Living by the law was tedious, to say the least. And this brother was upset and angry that his younger brother didn't have to make any penance for his actions. He just comes home and they throw a party for him. The younger brother represents the New Testament. You come as you are, broken, smelly, disgusting, no explanation needed, just a cry of mercy for forgiveness of sins. And when we come to Christ, the scripture tells us there is a big party in heaven rejoicing over your saved soul. That's in Luke 15, 10. The robe is placed on this prodigal son. The robe represents the righteousness of God that he wraps around you. My sin has been covered by the blood of Jesus on the cross of Calvary. Jesus is my robe of righteousness, the covering for my sin. I am clean, forgiven. I no longer stink from the effects of sin. I have a new life, a fresh start in life. Amen, anybody. The ring. The ring signifies the authority that God gives you. The ring was significant in the family. It showed by whose authority you spoke or conducted business. God has given each of his children authority over the works of the devil. You no longer belong to the devil. You no longer work for the devil. You have authority over the devil by the blood of Christ. Some may be here struggling with the injustices of life or even the story of the prodigal son. You may be thinking, you know, I've suffered, I've sacrificed, I've worked hard in God's church, and nobody ever recognized me 
or through a party for me. Hebrews 6.10 tells us, God has not forgotten your work. He has not. And the labors of love that you have shown. See, it's God we're working for. He rewards us. I think I'd rather be remembered by God than be remembered by man. Max Licato, in his book, The Grip of Grace, I might have shared this, I'm not sure, shares this extreme example. Does anybody remember Jeffrey Dahmer? He was the cannibal out in Chicago. That This was the late uh, 70s through 91, 78 to 91, actually. As we, um, Max describes the depths of the depravity of Jeffrey Dahmer's psychopathic actions of cannibalism. And as repugnant as Max found Dahmer's sins, there is one thing that has troubled Max. Dahmer's ability to seek and receive forgiveness for the sins that he committed. His sins were washed, soul cleansed, and past forgiven. God even loved Jeffrey Dahmer. How many of you are having a hard time with that right now? I know I, I kind of am. What's this? And as much as we may abhor the story, it's the truth right in front of us, isn't it? God can forgive that kind of a heinous crime? That tells me the richness and the depths of God's mercy and grace. I can't get there yet. I don't know how I would handle that kind of a situation. But some things, these things can only be dealt with by the power of the Holy Spirit. You may be asking yourself, you know, Brother Bill, how do we handle these situations or these people? It has been my experience in Christian circles that most are concerned more about seeking vengeance and justice rather than extending mercy and grace to the downtrodden in life. That's a bold, hard statement. I've seen it, and it's not pretty. Somebody breaks the law, we're like, well, we hope that uh, justice gets them. What about the mercy of God getting them? That's not the first thing on my mind sometimes. I'll be honest with you. I'm no different than anybody else here. I struggle with things. My attitude is not always the best. But I have to go to the word of God. And I have to line up my thoughts the way God sees things. The first thing we are instructed to do is pray for those that we have a difficult time with, according to Matthew 5. Pray to see them the way God sees them, through eyes of love. Love them the way Jesus does. And what does that mean? That your thoughts about them would be uh, about them finding salvation and experiencing the same love you yourselves have experienced. Not towards demise, judgment, and revenge, It's very hard to love people you don't like. But that is what God has called us to. And don't you think God knows that? This is why he gave every believer in Christ the gift of the Holy Spirit. To love others the way he loves us. And if you're having a hard time with that, may I suggest reading the book of 1 John. Meditate on that. Think about that. Ask the Holy Spirit to continue to just mold that over in your mind and in your heart. I need to pray right now for this. Lord, I, 
I know there are people struggling in this room about this. I know I am. There are times when my thoughts are not always about mercy and grace towards people that have offended me or have made some kind of injustice in the world. And I know there's people here that think of the same thing. So, Father, we're asking that your Holy Spirit, we're just taking a breather right now, Father, asking that your Holy Spirit would come right now and minister a salve that heals those wounds. Come now, Holy Spirit, you are welcome. In Jesus' name. See, God knows and he has a plan for the wicked of this world. In 2 Peter 2, 4-9, it tells us that he has a place reserved for the ungodly that do such evil. You may be here this morning and you're seething over a situation, grinding your teeth down to the gums, and you're saying, I'm angry now. I want vengeance now for someone, for what they've done to me. In fact, I'm planning on taking matters into my own hands. I'm so angry. Please don't. Please. If I can beg you of one thing, let God handle it. And this is coming right from, straight from the heart of God today. Please. I want to save you a bunch of heartache. God has a better way, and he has a way of taking care of those who mistreat you and at the same time giving you a future and a hope. I speak from experience. Please, if that is you today, please let God handle it. Let him handle it. Because Jesus is passing by. And he wants to give you his eyesight to see others the way that he sees them. God's word to you is this in Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and I'll give you a heart of flesh. In other words, that's a heart that feels things. I will make you sensitive to the things of God. You will feel what God feels. I will put my Holy Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, not your own. And you will keep my judgments and do them. See, this is what God is willing to do for you if you are willing to let him just ask. You must surrender it first to God piece by piece if you have to. See, the ground is level at the foot of the cross in case no one has told you. God's love, his mercy, and compassion are all metered out the same in full abundance. You may not like that, but that's how it is. It's the way God has set it up. We're all in need of the mercy and grace of God. The law doesn't save us, only the mercy, grace, and the blood of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Well, it seems to me like we've left somebody in the street, our blind man friend. Let's talk about him. The last we left him, he hears Jesus of Nazareth is passing by and he calls out, have mercy on me. He understood his need for an encounter with Jesus. He is the youngest son in the parable in need of the mercy of God. And the crowd responds, sit down, be quiet. We don't want to hear from you. We have our own agenda and it does not include you. You don't think the way we do. You don't fit into our plan. To some extent, this could be considered the older son. Isaiah 30, 10 is an oracle written to an obstinate nation, perhaps even the obstinate church, where it says, give us no more visions of what is right. We don't want to follow what is right. Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. 
Tell us we're doing great in our own without God and that God approves of our lifestyle even if it is a lie. Just appease our conscience. Leave this way, get off this path, stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. In other words, get it out of our way. We are forging ahead with our own spiritual political agenda that does not include you or your God. Stop being the roadblock that keeps us from our plans. Some could argue this is a fight within the Christian church as well. We want our liberal theology and our image of who we believe Jesus to be. We don't want to hear about the blood of Jesus, repentance, righteous living, sin, and its separation from God. We want to live in a state of compromise and feel good about it. And that, my friend, is why the church has lost its power in today's day and age. A little louder. Amen. The blind man keeps pushing and fighting. His need was too great to let Jesus just walk on by. He was desperate. He kept shouting all the more, mercy, mercy, mercy. Have mercy on me, son of David. And sometimes you just gotta fight like you're the third monkey on the ramp of Noah's Ark. And brother, it's starting to rain. Mercy, God. Mercy. Please extend your mercy and your grace to me. I'm desperate for a move of you, Lord. I'm like the older son, angry, bitter, and blind in my situation. Son of God, have mercy on me. Mercy on my life. There's no joy. There's no love. There's no peace. Have mercy on me. Like the physically blind man, I too am blind. I'm spiritually blind. Have mercy on me, son of God. What about you and me? How desperate are we today? For my recovery friends here, one of the first questions in recovery is this. What are you willing to do to stop your addiction? If the answer is anything but anything, you're not ready. See, Jesus is passing by the church today. Matter of fact, he's coming in to this building. He's with us here today. He's passing by your pew. Will you call out for the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ today? How does Jesus respond to the call for mercy? In verse 40, he stands still. Jesus is walking along and he stops. He hears the cry of the blind man. Have mercy on me, Lord Jesus. He stops. He stands still. And I like that phrase. He stops everything going on in the world around him to listen to that one desperate cry in the crowd. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, will you do for me what I cannot do for myself? Jesus, will you help me? Jesus does the same thing for you and for me. He stops all of heaven and sits still so we can hear your cry for help and for mercy. The God of heaven and earth and all that has been created has your attention. I find that is an amazing testimony of God's love for you and for me. In Isaiah 30, 18, the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. In my mind, I see a picture of the God of this universe sitting on the edge of the throne with just a bowl full of mercy ready to just pour it out if you just ask. Just ask. The question from Jesus what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? What a wonderful picture of the servanthood of Jesus. Jesus wants to do something for me? What do you want me to do for you? Notice that Jesus didn't say, do this for me first and we'll talk. No. This is a wonderful picture of an example of Jesus showing us 
that we should be the mindset of serving others, especially those who cannot do for themselves. And the man's reply is, I want to see. I want to receive my sight. And Jesus says, then receive your sight. Your faith has made you well. And the man immediately received his sight. The man was persistent in his plea to Jesus. He knew Jesus would and could heal him. Don't let the devil tell you your situation is helpless and hopeless. Don't give in to the thought that my son or daughter is beyond the reach of God's hand of mercy and grace. And I have a scripture for you to write it down if that is you and your situation. It's 2 Samuel 14, 14. Look it up and meditate on it this afternoon. Don't let others tell you, you will always be this way. Your situation will never change. Don't buy it, even on triple coupon day. Don't buy it. And don't let the devil tell you it will never amount to anything. Because Jesus is passing by today. His ear is listening to the cry of your heart today. Mercy, Lord Jesus. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Have mercy on my life, Lord Jesus. I have an addiction. My anger keeps getting in the way. I'm bitter and I demand justice. There is no peace or joy or love in my life. My Jesus, will you have mercy on me? I can't see. I can't see the life you desire for me because of all the junk in my life. Will you have mercy on me, Lord Jesus? And the resounding answer from heaven is, yes, I will. I will have mercy and grace on your life today because I love you. That scripture was 2 Samuel 14, 14. Jesus will have mercy on you. He will love light like you've never experienced that before. He will embrace you. He will accept you. Like the prodigal son, just confess and accept the wonderful gift of God's love for you. Don't listen to the older brother that says, you have to give an account first. You have to get your act cleaned up, smell good, look good. Put on the old spice if you have to. Does any guy use that anymore? But God opposes the proud. But he gives what? Grace to the humble. Yes. Yes. Are you crying out for God's mercy and grace today? Jesus is passing by. He's passing by all through here today. And he's looking for a heart that says, have mercy, from, have mercy, Jesus. Have mercy in my life. Will you ask him? Or will you simply just let him pass by? Giving into the crowd around you saying you're not worth it. You don't count. You're a nobody. What God says, <laughs> you're so worth it. Otherwise, I would not have sent my son to die for you. And God says, I delight in rebuilding lives. Do you believe that? I do. As always, I try to incorporate this passage in every message. Some of you know what I'm going to say. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Do you believe that? I believe it. Both of my hands are up. I believe it. We serve a miracle-working God, don't we? God says, you don't know what you'll look like when I'm done with you. Which will be an eternity, by the way. But I guarantee you'll like the results if you just let me be merciful to you. Amen. Jesus is passing by. And what's your cry to him today? Leave me alone or 
have mercy on me. Let's pray. Father, your presence is here. And I know that your Holy Spirit wants to do a work and a job in your people that are gathered here in your name. Only you know the hearts, Father, of those that are struggling, that are hurting, and that are in need of your love and grace and mercy in their situations that they're in. So I'm asking, Father, that right now your Holy Spirit would continue to do the work for those that are crying out for you. Prepare our hearts now, Father, as we come before your table of remembrance. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us continue closing this part of our service out singing 376, I have decided to follow Jesus. And if that commitment you have not made and you wish to do that today, this altar is open, Bill is up here, please feel free to let the Lord into your life. Let the Holy Spirit lead. May we please stand and sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. And then we'll go into communion. celebration of our Lord Jesus, of the mercy and the grace and the love that he has shown out, shown to us on the cross of Calvary. In the Gospel of Luke, in 22, in verse 14, when the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said to them, with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it. And gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. 
Let us take the cracker portion of our communion. Father, we lift up the body of Christ that was bruised and beaten on our behalf for the payment of sins. Father, let us never forget of the kindness and the love that you have shown to us on Calvary. Let us partake with thanksgiving in our hearts. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. But behold, the hand of the betrayer is with me on this table. And truly, the Son of Man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 22, it tells us that the Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. This is what makes Christendom much different than all the other world religions. Without the shedding of blood, no forgiveness of sins. Let us partake, let's peel back the, the juice portion of our cup. And Father, we lift up the blood of Jesus to you, this representation of it, that we always be mindful that it was his precious blood spilt on the cross that gives us freedom, gives us liberty, gives us hope. It brings new life to those that believe in you. It brings the forgiveness of sin for those that confess before you. Let us partake of thanksgiving in our hearts. Scripture tells us that when they left the upper room, they sang a hymn. And we're going to do that in following with that tradition. Brother Cam? Let us please stand and sing together 282, The Family of God. I think we don't know it by memory, but in case you don't, it's 282.
Pat to preach the word of God. The Apostle Paul, when he was writing to the Ephesians, he closed this letter, or close to the end of it, by penning these words, and I'd like to close my time with you, this season with you, with these words. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family of heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us to him be glory in the church of Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. That's a sermon. So let's start with Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I have loved interacting with each and every one of you. We're yeah. friends. Jesus name I pray. Amen. Amen. 